Let me introduce what courts actually do, because there are all sorts of images of what courts do. What do they actually do? The basic purpose of courts is that they take decisions and they produce judgments. Um, in some cases, that means that they solve actual problems. In a lot of cases, it doesn't, because the limitations of what courts do mean that they cannot, they can take a legally binding decision, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem. They all hold the legal order. How do they do that? Mainly by the shadow function that courts have. We publish all our decisions, my judiciary publishes about 50,000 decisions a year, and those decisions are guidelines, not just for the parties concerned, but also for other people. So that, that's the important societal role that courts have. Um, and how do courts do that? They process information. This looks like a very simple thing to say, but it's not in the mental makeup of most of my colleagues, but it's my job to explain how that works. So let's look how that, see how that works. But before we do that, a little bit about what do we mean when we say data and information. Um, the official data, or the definition of data, means that you have it's two or five or 17 or yes or no, but you have no idea what that means. That's what they say, just data. They become information if you give them context of it. So for instance, two millimeters of rain, five eggs, 17 travelers on the tram, then that's how it becomes information. Um, and now, I, look, I thought I'd give you the definition by the GDPR, and I was really surprised when I looked that up, because what does it say? The GDPR says personal data are any information that is identified, that is related to an identified or identifiable person. So, as in data and information are the same thing, but they're not. This is just because I think it's important to keep that in mind. So, for instance, what GDPR means by, by uh, personal data is traveler John is on tram, on tram 2 right now, or someone with a social given social security number is on tram, tram 2. That's an identifiable kind of uh, personal information. Now, let's look at what courts do. And I'm going to walk you through a, one of my uh, most interesting cases of, the, of recent years. This is the Amsterdam court. You can see that it's uh, in sort of disarray because they're tearing each tower down one by one and building a new one. Um, let's look at my case. This case, it was a very interesting one. I was, at the time, I was an administrative judge, and so that means that we look at decisions that were taken by uh, a, a government authority and to see if they did that properly. In this case, we had members of the public who had complained to the, uh, the personal data authority about the way a public transport uh, agent was using their data. Um, and what they did, was that this, this public transport uh, provider had built a system with which they could analyze uh, travel data, which is very important. You want to know how many trams you need and all sorts of stuff. So that in itself, that was a good idea, but they were keeping the data, the passenger data, so Traveler John was on track to today, um, more than six months in a personally identifiable way, and that's against the law. It was against the law before GDPR, and that has not changed. So if you keep data for longer than six months, generally speaking, um, generally speaking, that's important to keep in mind, after six months, you either have to throw them away, or you have to make sure that they are no longer personal data, that you make them identifiable. That's a very general statement. Don't go out and do it like that, because there's more to it than this. But for the, for the example, so this is what we had to uh, hear. This was, it was a big case, so I did that. I presided over it with two other judges. And there was the, the, the on one side was the, uh, the public transport provider who had appealed a decision by the personal data authority, which had told them to do with something that they didn't want to do. At least throw away the data or do something else with them. And so we had this case. And for about one and a half hours, the two most eminent personal information lawyers in the country argued about whether what they were keeping was personal information or not. Well, 
to us very few people. So we, they argued and we asked a couple of questions. And after one and a half hours, everybody was very tired. So I thought we were going to have a break. And in the break, my colleague said to me, does this really have to happen? This is ridiculous. So um, after the coffee break, we came back to the room. And I think that from the questions we had asked in the first round, it was fairly clear that we wanted none of what they were, what the public transport provider was saying. So I, I sat back in my chair and I thought, what should I do? I said, I don't think I'll just tell them. I said to them, um, you know, we have in the coffee break, we said to each other, does it really have to be like this? And I'd like you to think about that for a minute. Would you like to have 10 minutes so you can discuss whether you want to settle again? And they both said they wanted, to, they wanted that discussion. Okay, 10 minutes, after 10 minutes, we go back and have some more coffee. You come back here after 10 minutes and tell me where you are. And surprise, they had settled. So I, I like, and we judges like people settling their cases much more than when we have to make a judgment. Not because we don't like to do that, but because we like peaceful resolution. So this is what happened there. And actually, um, here we have the trial. There are a lot of aspects in this case which I think make it interesting to think about for a little while. There is the data and personal information issue. We also see that data have an economic value. And why was that? Because afterwards I heard from, from someone that um, this public transport provider had invested largely in this analysis, this analytical tool with which they were, they were uh, uh, analyzing the data, and they didn't want to change that because they, put stuff in, they had put a lot of money into it. So there's economic value in the data, and in this case also in the analysis. They made an investment. Members of the public were able to make a complaint about the use of their data, and they did. Uh, there's a compliance authority who is who has to receive those complaints, and if they if they are justified, actually enforce them. Um, and at some point, they take a decision and they they, they told the public the transport provider what they had to do. They didn't agree, so they appealed to the court, and ultimately that was a settlement. So they agreed, and it, when I looked at the settlement carefully, I thought, you know, actually they have just simply lost the argument. So this is, this is what happened in that case. Um, so courts process all sorts of information. And uh, we still, and I know this is true for most courts in Europe, we still keep most of our information on paper, which is sad but true. Um, so let's see, we have personal information. We have, for all the parties that, that, that come through our courts, we have names and addresses and have family relations sometimes. There's health information, which according to GDPR has a special privileged status, needs more protection even than ordinary personal data. Business secrets. Um, firms will have to, they have to disclose business secrets in order to you know, argue their case properly. So what do we do with that information? Then there is government information. In the administrative courts, um, we get to deal with cases where the government has withheld information from the public. And those decisions can also be appealed. And sometimes that is even intelligence, top secret intelligence information. So all sorts of information. And who should have access to that information? Generally speaking, the access to information is on a need to know basis. Uh, this is something we have to really think about when we started building digital systems, because then you actually, you can close, you can act much more accurately on who gets to see what. And for instance, court staff, uh, administrative court staff, may have to have access to some information in the case file, but not everything. Um, lawyers, parties' lawyers, have access to the information in their cases, including all the information in the case files about what's happened here. And that was easy to do because most lawyers in Europe have some form of digital identification so we can recognize this is lawyer A, and lawyer A has access always to cases B, C, D, E, and F. So that's easy. Then we have parties. We would love to give parties access to digital case files. Um, but, and, and we actually try to build it. But unfortunately, um, we also need to be able to identify those parties when they 
sort of, when, when, when they, they access our website. And right now, in a lot of European countries, digital identification is not secure enough to be able to give people access to what is essentially other people's personal information. Your own personal information. I mean, I can do my tax returns online. That's my information. But as soon as there is another party involved, who gets access to that information? That's a different problem. And then we have the general public. Um, the courts, courts are a public institution, and the outcomes of what happens in courts should be public. So the general public should be able to see what courts do, and they should also be able to see what, what the outcomes are. Um, and there are some constraints to that. One of them is the constraint in Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights on private life. So I was talking with Luca during the break, and I said, look, you have no need to know that your uh, neighbor has had a divorce. You have a need maybe to know that you do divorces properly, but you don't, that's not a need that you have. So you don't get access to that information. So need to know happen is, is, is goes through all this, these access issues. Something else we had to think about, uh, but related, was how do we store information if we don't do it on paper? We have a perfectly good uh, solution for keeping intelligence and government information, even if it's secret, on paper, because we do that with signatures and you know, keys and things. But And we have not yet found a solution to do that securely online, so we don't do it. We keep that on paper. And that's, as long as you don't know how the new, whether the new solution is going to work, Keep the old one if you know that that does. Would be the rule for that one. And in published decisions, we have a policy where, in most cases, personal information is being anonymized for decisions that are made public. And that is across Europe. That is about that is the rule. And in the US, they find that fairly difficult to understand because it's information that was put together with public money. So in the US, you can find court decisions. You can actually find it if your neighbor had a divorce or not. Um, and it's, they're now beginning to realize that they, these may cause problems because the information is so easily distributed. But still, this is the rule. So, OK, where are we? It's also good to remember that courts are not on their own. They are part of a cloud. Like, you know, of course, healthcare is also part of a cloud. But so are courts. And courts start with people, people who have a problem. And there can be all sorts of family problems, uh, money problems, uh, criminal record problems. And when people have a problem, they don't, they're not interested in legal things at all, usually. They want to solve their problem. So before, let's say 20 years ago, they would ask their family members, and now they ask Google how to solve their problem. Um, and if that does not help, and the problem is big enough, sometimes people abandon their problem. But sometimes when it's big enough, they go and find expert advice. Also through Google, they find a lawyer through Google or whatever. And it's the experts who actually suggest going to court. So it's very unusual for people to decide for themselves that they're going to go to court. That's almost never happened. We also know from research that was done that if they go to court, <coughs> court decisions may not solve the problem because of the restrictions that courts have. Um, for instance, if, if uh, part of the problem that someone has is that they don't own their house, uh, but I am a family judge, I cannot decide that. So this simple thing. And what we also know is that the most vulnerable people, who I think deserve maybe even more legal protection than some other people, will not are not easily helped by digital support. We try and do it, we have to think about it very carefully, but we cannot use the same kind of instrument for everybody. So this is the cloud that we were looking at when we were designing digital procedures. Um, and another aspect of the cloud is something that we now read a lot about, and that is predicting uh, outcomes of court cases. And because this is so big, I'm, putting, I'm giving you a little more of a peek inside in that. Um, keep in mind when that, that unpredictable outcome, case, court case outcomes, are an economic risk. If you are, um, uh, you are a bank 
and you are suing a big client uh, for damages or uh, then then for you this is this is uh, something that is worth a lot of money so an unpredictable outcome if you have no idea what which way your case is going usually banks have in they have in-house lawyers and they know but if you have no idea where your case is going this is a big economic so there is a market for predicting outcomes. That's how simple it is. Um, and there are, I'm going to show you some examples of how those outcomes are, 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 are predicted or maybe forecast, that's probably a better word. And the principle is that, that this is artificial intelligence that crunches all the court decisions it can find, and it comes with a forecast. Um, that assumes that those decisions are correct. Now, I know some of them are not, for all sorts of reasons. So what, what does the judgment actually look like? A, a, a legal, legally uh, valid decision talks first about what happened and what were the circumstances. And let me tell you, that sounds very simple, but uh, if you two, if you have a conflict, and what you, what you think happened is completely different from what you think happened. So that's where it starts. Um, and then the rules, how to interpret the rules, you will interpret them differently than you will. So, um, and then there is an analysis. So, it will be about what do you agree on, what do you disagree on, and how do we resolve that, and that will determine the outcome. So this is how we do judging. Um, and we talk a lot. We talk to people all the time, and we listen to people all the time. Uh, we have very simple cases that do not take a lot of work. We have cases where people have to go to court because they need a stamp from the court before they can uh, go on with their lives. That's this group here. Number three is where we talk so much until people settle the case, like I told you before. And number four in the top right-hand corner is where nobody finds a solution and then we have to, there's nothing for it but the judge has to decide. So, um, think, think of court procedures as a conversation uh, between parties and, and the judge about what happened and what the significance of what happened is for the position of those people. That conversation is also a complexity reduction. What do, what do they agree on? What are, what are the big points of disagreement and how do I decide those? And here again, more or less the same thing as on the, on the former uh, sheet is the legal reasoning. That, that we apply to get a legally um, binding outcome, and that almost always also considered, contains moral considerations. What is equitable, what is just, things like that. So, some examples of predictions. This is the uh, US Supreme Court in its present composition. We see Neil Gorsuch in the right, top right hand corner, and um, these um, scholars in the US have actually developed an algorithm that will um, forecast what outcomes of US Supreme Court cases will be, and they are extremely important for life in the US. What it uses, this, this uh, algorithm, is not just information about the, their decisions, but it's about the judges themselves, their political stances, who appointed them, biography, there's no legal reasoning whatsoever, so this is statistics mostly. And they claim an accuracy of 70.2%. Now, you are scientists, so you probably know more about statistics than I do, but 50, 50 is completely random. So, I don't know that 70, it looks good to people who know nothing about statistics, but I don't think it's that good. Okay. Uh, what is also on the market in the US are uh, tools where you can compare judges and courts. So if you have a, if you're a lawyer, that's the lawyers are the market for this kind of thing. If you are a lawyer and you have a case um, and you have your argument, then you can test your argument here in this tool that is uh, solved by LexisNexis um, to see who, which court or which judge would be uh, susceptible to your argument. Very great economic value. And the other one, yes, is judge profiles, uh, where you can actually see 
which judge would has done this and that and, and has is sensible it would be you know like likable to do what you want um, this is also this is a tool for lawyers um, but I think that judiciaries worldwide have to think about what this means for for instance judges performance evaluation I mean if this thing forecasts that I will go in a certain direction, and it does like the 100 forecasts a year if I have 100 cases. And in 10% of those cases, I don't follow that forecast. And the lawyers complain to the president of my court about this. What does that mean for my performance evaluation? So we really have to think about it. Judge Cornhouse. This is the European Court of Human Rights. It has more judges than the US Supreme Court. Um, but they, there's also an exercise on forecasting their outcomes. That was done by uh, two scholars at, I think, the London School of Economics. And they, they are scholars. The, the, the other people sell their product, so they will not tell you how it works because that's proprietary information. But Aletros and Sarapatan is actually, we are very grateful to them because they wrote a nice article explaining how their algorithm works. It counts words and word groups in the judgments. So it uses the judgments, um, which are natural language, law pieces of text. And then with statistic probability, they forecast how that is going to, what the outcome is going to be. Um, they also use no explanation. There's no legal reasoning. And they say that their accuracy is 79%. Now that looks more impressive. Uh, but try and imagine how that works in the European Court of Human Rights. If they get, let's say statistically speaking, they get 100 cases, about one case will ever make it to the court. Because all the others they will be non-receivable, or they will be dealt with by the clerk's office, or all sorts of things can happen to those cases. Only the very big, important cases ever make it to the European Court of Human Rights. And I wonder what you think when I tell you that all the cases that do come to the court, 84% of the cases, the court decides that there is a violation of the convention. So if you don't know anything, you close your eyes and you say they will decide for a violation, the chance that you that you are right is bigger than you do. Nevertheless, it, it helps to explain, to, to understand how these prediction algorithms actually work. What else do I have? Oh yeah, this. Uh, this is a COMPAS, is a tool that is in use in, at least in the courts in Florida, in the United States, where uh, if judges have to decide about, if they, if they want to know how, how big the risk is for the defendants re-offending, and that can be important for people who are in jail and who can either be released or not, or, or for all sorts of other things. And they use Compass as a tool for that. That's an interesting algorithm, and um, it crunches all the cases and whether people re-offend or not. And so they, uh, the, and ProPublica, which is a public uh, research organization in the US, uh, tested this tool and found that it is extremely racist. Look at this. These two defendants have exactly the same situation. They were arrested for petty theft, they have no criminal record, no nothing, and yet poor Grisha gets a high risk evaluation from the algorithm. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion going on in the US, but they still use this tool. Why is that? Because meanwhile, there has been some case law on situations like this. And the, the Supreme Court of Wisconsin, for instance, uh, uh, decided that it was permissible to use a tool like this. And why was that? Because the decision is not taken automatically by a machine. It is taken by a human who either takes this result in a, into account one way or the other. And as long as, it, as it's human control, that's fine. Um, the case was presented to the U.S. Court, the United States Court, uh, Supreme Court, but they didn't. They decided not to take it because they thought that was harmful. They didn't think that was a breach 
of the legal order. So here we are. What else? So, because we are beginning to realize that we cannot, we need a normative framework for the use of artificial intelligence, there are um, now five principles that were developed by the Commission for the Efficiency of Justice at the Council of Europe, and I helped them draft this, uh, the document that explains how this works, and these are the five principles. Clearly, respect for fundamental rights, uh, all human rights need to be taken into consideration, non-discrimination, I think from Paul Brescia, it's clear what we mean by that. Um, what was, what's the reason that Brescia gets such a high, high rating? That's because criminal justice in the US is fairly racist. So, because there are so many more black people in the system, as soon as you're black, the system is, tends to think, ah, you're black, you're bound to live it. Data quality, we already talked a little bit about that this morning. Um, and security of the data, of course, are important. Transparency, what do you do? Uh, we could see that <coughs> the American algorithm, we have no idea how it works, but at least the European example we do. Um, and we can either disagree with the way it does that, because that's important to be able. If you are, for instance, if you are a party in a court case and your counterpart is using a result from an algorithm, you want to know how that works because you have to be able to defend yourself. And the last one, under user control, that's what, we were, what I was talking about with poor Grisha. Ultimately, her, her, her penalty was not decided by the system, but by a human using the system or deciding not to use it. So those are the five principles. Meanwhile, the EU has done beautiful guidelines on the use of, of AI uh, in a much broader context. Uh, there are, the OECD has done one. I, I, I tried to make an inventory a while ago, and then there were 25, but by now there are already more, starting with, what was it? Um, the first law of, of robotics. I think, yeah, that brings me to the end of my, my talk.